So, um, as Vittorio said, I'm here both as a career scientist and as a science expert at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, what I try to do, and I will skip a lot of slides because otherwise we would not make it in time, but what I thought I would do was first introduce the institution because there are some areas of research at Crema which may be of interest and maybe have the potentiality to create synergies. And then I will go through uh, these aspects. But of course I have slides from my colleagues uh, and not all of it is my work uh, and the scientists are really picking on being able to describe work in detail and so on. I will uh, go through this uh, set of slides hoping that you can pick up according to your own <coughs> backgrounds what might be of interest. And then I will end by describing what we do at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and why is diplomacy interesting in science, which is something that many people don't understand, and I did it before I got there. Um, so let's start with CREA. So CREA is uh, uh, actually a, comp a composite organization because it, it, it started as a number, uh, by joining a number of research centers all throughout the countries, there are more than 40 institutes, but it was recently reorganized in a, a more homogeneous way, which seems to work much, much better, uh, in 12 research centers. So we are all around Italy, uh, but the research centers, the research activities are grouped into 12 research centers which are delocalized, so one center may have different uh, institutes uh, in different parts of Italy. Uh, and the idea was to have six centers that are focused on value chains. So you see here is uh, animal husbandry, wooden forestry, cereals, viticulture, vegetables, uh, olives, citrus, etc. And the other six centers would be cross-cutting and would make, uh, would be interested in a scientific basis that could be of help in uh, all the different uh, uh, value chain uh, areas. And I come from uh, the Food and Nutrition Research Center, which used to be a national <coughs> institute until 2012. And uh, um, most of what I'll show you uh, n now comes from scientists in the Genomics and Bioinformatics Research Center and in the uh, in the Agriculture and Environment Research Center, but I have it on the slides. Okay, so this is how we are structured, and uh, being in a United Nations based uh, uh, place, uh, our, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, of the 2030 Agenda, we are mostly on number 15, life on land, uh, as the, the major interest of the Institute is agriculture, and how to improve and use uh, agriculture, how to make it sustainable, etc. But we also have the zero hunger, which it relates to uh, the, uh, the center I come from, the research center I come from, uh, nutrition, and uh, as well as responsible consumption and production, which involves the entire um, CREA. Uh, some um, energy bi from biomass, if there is uh, some research on this, uh, and the climate action is um, very well targeted with the Agriculture and Environment uh, Research Center. Uh, now, let's start with the microbiome. Now, microbiome is, uh, is really a, a, a word that uh, nowadays uh, interests everybody. And uh, this is uh, an old paper at this point because it's a 2016 paper, but it, it very well shows how uh, microbiome and microbiota in the scientific <laughs> literature uh, started having an exponential increase uh, in the number of hits in the title or abstract uh, when the two big European and American efforts of sequencing the gut microbiome, the human gut microbiome were funded. And, uh, and this is uh, typical uh, of this Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies that slightly relates to the microbiome, and it still does, because uh, it's not clear whether we've reached the peak or not. But all 
uh, new and emerging technologies uh, uh, start with this uh, pattern, with this, uh, with this slope, and then they start coming down when, uh, well, through this illusionment, because in the beginning, uh, everything is supposed to be solved by studying that particular technology, now it is the microbiome. I'm not really sure that we are, we've reached uh, the top <coughs> as far as the gut microbiome is concerned, but I think we are almost there. So the outcome of these two large sequencing projects was uh, the quantity versus quality issue. Uh, 10 to the 12 uh, are, is, is the number of bugs that we host in our gut. And 10 to the 14 is the biodiversity of the bugs that we host. So the biodiversity of the genomes, then the number of genomes being much more sensitive, the, 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 genomic, the, the, the genomic approach being much more, much more sensitive than the culturing approach that, that cuts out a number of unculturable species. Uh, and uh, still, um, the Nature and the, all the journals uh, also started uh, uh, publishing more and more and more any discovery on the microbiome. And this is something I did uh, a few days ago to update the table. And um, as you see, if you put the microbiome or microbiota in the title or abstract, just them, any, any type of microbiota or microbiome, you get a number of hits, which is uh, very relevant, but half of them, more or less, relate to gut. So if you link gut and microbiome, gut and microbiota. However, plants, soil, and food are coming up, and uh, this is what is even more important now, to try and understand uh, whether, well, microbiomes, uh, gut microbiome has been associated with uh, almost any disease on earth. Uh, any, dis any disease on earth has now a published association, positive or negative, be it with the, the microbiome. And we don't know how reliable this is because uh, um, the mechanisms are very often lacking. There's only correlation. And we know that uh, the correlation uh, can be really uh, stabilized once it has a function. And uh, the causal relation that, that is missing is uh, the issue with the microbiome. Now, maybe this is with humans, but human pathologies are quite complex. Maybe with plants, uh, life would be a little easier. But I'm not a plant microbiologist, so you will uh, be able to tell me about this. Um, now, plant microbiomes, the, the literature is definitely increasing, uh, as well as the hits, uh, and the knowledge is increasing on plant microbiomes. Um, there has been um, um, parallelism was made between plants and gut, because in a sense, um, the plant microbiota within tissue or on the surfaces, the endophytes or the epiphytes, seems to have similar uh, beneficial activities as the bugs in our, in our gut. Uh, improving nutrient acquisition and growth, uh, sustaining plant growth under different types of stresses, uh, and uh, inducing resistance against pathogens, so stimulating plant immunity, which is exactly what probiotics uh, are supposed to do in our gut plus interacting with, uh, of course, with the other environmental factors. Now, the, the plant microbiome is uh, a little more complex in terms of location because uh, for, for humans, we do have skin microbiomes, uh, um, microbiomes in many different organs, especially the external surfaces, but most of it, absolutely the majority, the, 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 the real majority is in our gut. So what we study is usually association with the gut microbiome and disease. In terms of plants, uh, there are different locations uh, where a microbiota can be in a consistent number. 
and therefore uh, with a possible important, potential important fun function. And one of it is the roots. The, the root microbiota is, seems to be critical for plant health and for agricultural yield, which is in parallel with the microbiota for, for human health. Um, the rhizosphere microbiota in the soil can, can be also harmful or neutral. It's not necessarily beneficial, and this is emerging more and more from the, from the studies on soil microbiota. And the, 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 the most interesting aspect, which really distinguishes plants from, uh, from humans, uh, is the fact that there are these uh, um, symbiotic fungi which uh, um, have absolutely no correspondence with anything <coughs> in humans. The rhizobia nitrogen fixing bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi uh, that increase uh, the ability of the roots to extract nutrients. So this is typical of the plants and uh, um, also the, the philosphere contains uh, important uh, bacterial uh, communities. Uh, and all of these different um, microbial consortia uh, ha are being studied because uh, when we touch the plant, we have to consider the importance for agriculture. So uh, Arabidopsis doesn't seem to be a good uh, model for uh, studying the um, agricultural microbiome. And um, more than anything, for agriculture, we need to identify uh, uh, an effect on yield, on crop yield. And therefore, um, we need to study the plant <coughs> phenotype and the environmental <coughs> challenges that can cooperate in selecting a beneficial microbiome that can positively affect yield. Um, apparently, uh, cereals lost uh, um, the um, symbiotic relationship with uh, um, many of these uh, bacterial and fungal consortia. So one important aspect is to uh, identify the conditions for uh, recovering this type of uh, beneficial um, interaction uh, in cereals. And, um, and at, that, at, at this moment, uh, uh, the main priorities that we can see uh, in agricultural microbiome research is indeed to find models where science can be done. And models which can be colonized by microbes uh, and therefore allowing the study of specific consortia and uh, um, in the model house uh, with the results that can be extended to other agronomical important species. Uh, the other aspect which uh, is true also for, for humans is to identify the core microbiomes and the metagenomes in these models because uh, um, Microbiome, the, 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 the limitation of, the, of studying these complex consortia is the fact that they're all different. It, you study them in different plants, in different humans, in different places, in different environments, and they're all different, which makes it very hard to draw conclusions. But if uh, uh, reliable and reproducible and good models are uh, defined, then uh, it would be possible to study what the core microbiome is uh, which in humans uh, is established uh, during infancy. Uh, it's, it's also affected by the type of delivery. And that core microbiome persists uh, irrespective of all the environmental changes that uh, can be, that are mainly diet, disease, and other, uh, other factors. Uh, the core microbiome persists, and uh, in, in humans, the only cure uh, microbiome dependent cure is to kill the entire microbiome and do the fecal transfer, which is becoming more and more uh, common to uh, try and introduce a healthy microbiome in cases in which uh, uh, there's no other alternative. Uh, well, plants uh, also have 
core microbiomes, which are established uh, in early phases and depend on the soil and the type of soil uh, and uh, the genetics and the environmental factors. And uh, I will show you that one of the slides that I have is indeed uh, studying these core microbiomes, which have a lower biodiversity because they, 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 they persist over the life of the plant, just like the life of the human. And uh, it's the majority of the other species that surround this core microbiome, which are affect <coughs> more affected by the environment. So all of this to identify functional mechanisms. And if you, if you wish, I, I like the, 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 um, the um, gen more general perspectives. And this is a very complex scheme that was published and that uh, reducing it to the, to the um, essential, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a one health view of the study of uh, microbiota and microbiomes. But uh, it relates uh, very well the soil, the animals and plants, uh, and uh, the effect on humans. And this is the food chain, basically. So this is where I'm going because uh, um, I'm not really strictly, I've never worked with plants. I've worked with microbes, but in uh, more in human and animal systems. And uh, uh, when we, be, when, when our institute <coughs> was merged into CREA, an agriculture organization, uh, I thought it was wonderful to have all these experts of soil and uh, plant um, m microbiotas because in this way, we could complete the, set, the circle. And that's where I'm going with this presentation. So this part from soil to plants uh, is uh, uh, just a, a quick flash of a few um, labs uh, which uh, study um, the microbiology of plants uh, and might be hopefully of interest uh, to you here. Uh, one is Stefano Mocali, whom uh, uh, Dario knows well, from the um, Research Center on Agriculture and Environment. The, he, he works in Florence. Uh, this center has different locations, uh, Rome, Florence, and other cities. So he is a soil microbial ecologist that uh, re recently moved to studying the plant-associated microorganisms and uh, is trying to study the composition and the role of the plant-associated microbiome. Um, he studied basically, these are the four main lines of his lab, and uh, one by one in uh, this plant, uh, it's a medicinal plant, uh, he uh, demonstrated that endophytic bacterial communities are differently distributed in different organs, and they can influence the secondary metabolism of the plant, affecting the therapeutic pro properties for which this plant was known. So the therapeutic properties of this medicinal plant can change depending on the associated microbiome, which I thought was very interesting. Then this is another, uh, another line of research uh, in which they study the seed microbiome in contaminated sites uh, and uh, um, demonstrated that the, the microbiome of the rhizosphere was uh, um, very similar to the soil where they grow. And uh, from there, they could isolate copper-tolerant seed endophytes and uh, inoculated it to propose to try and induce and transfer the copper tolerance to plants uh, grown in uh, soils <coughs> where they were undergoing metal stress. So this is another type of this with uh, specific uh, um, strains. And uh, then um, as far as more general agriculture applications, uh, vine. Um, in vines, uh, what they're studying is uh, uh, with a, a project uh, funded under the LIFE uh, scheme in uh, a couple of years ago, almost three years ago, they're studying um, biostimulant-based solutions 
for vineries and trying to increase the environmental uh, sustainability uh, by studying the microbial diversity of the soil and associated with the plants. So this is finalized, uh, this is uh, funded by the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Agriculture through the life scheme and uh, it's, um, it's obviously of interest for the, um, applications in agriculture. Uh, this was recently funded in the, uh, under the Horizon 2020 scheme and the project is called Excalibur and it studies the soil biodiversity <coughs> applied to horticultural plants. Um, studying the role of micro microbes in uh, mm. biocontrol and biofertilization practices uh, in this type of farming. So, as you see, this type of, um, of research uh, uses uh, the expertise of the CREA scientists that work in the single um, vine, citrus, olive, and uh, adds uh, the research angle of microbiologists, molecular biologists, biochemists, etc. So it seems to work uh, quite well, this new organization that was given. So um, in this system, Excalibur, they will study because they're just starting. The, the project is, uh, was, uh, was recently funded, so it's just starting, and they're going to study mostly the plant soil microbe interactions and the mechanism. <coughs> Um, underlying the effects of this uh, bioinocular on plant stress responses. So, in case you're interested, this project is really starting. Uh, now, in a, the other center, Agriculture and Environment, is a cross -cut cutting um, research center um, that uh, is contributing a lot to this type of research, but also the, the genomics and bioinformatics angle is very important. Uh, um, especially for complex microbial consortia like the microbiomes. This is uh, uh, what I will show you is a few slides of projects uh, that are funded at the Research Center on Genomics and Bioinformatics Scientists. The center is directed by Luigi Castivelli, whom uh, I think you know also, and is located in Fiorenzuola d'Arda. And this is one of the few centers like the Food and Nutrition in Rome, which are localized in a single place. Actually, we have also a Rome extension, but most of it is in Fiorenzuola data. Uh, they are very interested in arboscular mycorrhiza fungi because the symbiosis is not as well established with cereals, and they work a lot with wheat, durum wheat. Uh, Luigi was uh, in the consortia, consortium that um, recently, a couple of years ago, I think, published the whole sequence of the dual wheat, and it was a large consortium by many groups worldwide. So he is very, um, cereals are, and wheat in particular are very important for him. So it, the, the, this type of, uh, uh, of microbes, uh, of soil microbes, uh, uh, that colonize the, 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 the root, uh, have a very positive impact on wheat growth and therefore being able and also in the response to a ser series of stresses uh, um, am among them drought and uh, uh, so this 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 studying these uh, um, uh, these associations these uh, fungal associations with interaction with plants can really be um, lead to outcomes which are very important and applicable for uh, improving the yield efficiency. Um, now, the, the, this was just to show the beneficial interaction at the root level. Uh, and uh, here is what I am anticipated, the study of, uh, of course, with a genomic angle, of the microbiome, the, 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 the wheat rhizosphere microbiome that can distinguish between the core microbiome and uh, the, um, all the other microbiome. And uh, of course the core microbiome displays low diversity, stable and abundant across all conditions. 
On the other hand, the accessory microbiome is extremely diverse and condition specific. Now, why is, this is very important. Uh, it's very important because uh, the accessory microbiome that confers the increased biodiversity in terms of functional, this is the genomic structure, but uh, in terms of functional capacity, i.e. the metagenome, i.e. the capacity to produce uh, an, a broad number of metabolites is extremely important. So uh, the, it's, it's very important to identify the core microbiome and it's very important to study the, the, the remaining part that adds to the biodiversity and therefore to the uh, metagenome capacity. Now, uh, this is another project, the H2020 project, that is in collaboration between uh, uh, the Center for Genomics and Bioinformatics and, again, Agriculture and Environment, but uh, this is the Rome, um, the Rome uh, Institute with Roberta Farina. So this is in collaboration between two centers, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, also um, aimed, uh, especially in this work package, uh, on uh, um, the impact of the cropping systems with the, to in, an increase in biodiversity and uh, the conditions in, the, um, in the, 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 the culture that can um, increase biodiversity and how this is controlled by the environmental factors. So this is also uh, a project that will probably give interesting results. And uh, um, to finish with these slides, uh, um, um, Valeria Terzi, head uh, uh, from the same center of genomics and bioinformatics, had uh, uh, a, actually, a, a great relevance project funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, on the role of essential oils and different compounds uh, um, with uh, these uh, um, antifungal and anti hypotoxigenic properties uh, and uh, with uh, it's a bilateral with uh, Algeria. Now, I feel a little more at ease in the from foot to gut aspect, but I have to run. Uh, because it's what I have studied in with my group has studied for the past uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, we worked a lot now that we are in, in collaboration with the, the research center on animal hundreds, well, the Lodi group, the Lodi food microbiology group, which is in one of the uh, value chain, is part of the value chain. Um, research centers uh, because they have an incredible uh, expertise in the dairy sector. So we move from plants to dairy, but uh, I will try to show you that there are very similar mechanisms uh, when, when we get to bugs. Um, so they're very good in dairy microbiology and uh, they, they, they've studied the diversity of the um, dairy products, which I have to mention, they're fermented products, that's why we study bugs in these, in these products. And uh, since uh, they are mostly traditional, their um, production, um, this, the, 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 the protocol with which they are made has to be um, reproducible, the same, they have to follow a specific protocol, otherwise they don't get the, the <coughs> label, the, the PDO label. And in many, many cases, uh, it involves uh, the, the, the inoculum to fermentation comes from the raw material. So it's natural. It comes from the environment. And it cannot be, be reproduced in different geographical areas. So uh, they, they have an, a, a, a very good collection of uh, gram-positive, not pathogenic, uh, therefore, uh, bacteria mostly lactobacilli and uh, lactococci, which are uh, involved in these dairy fermentations. And we've collaborated with them because we were interested in studying mechanisms. And uh, we come from, this is my group, which is now there without me because I'm at the ministry, but they are going on very well. And uh, um, we, we 
started as molecular biologists, all of us. So we were interested in mechanisms. And with their knowledge, very good knowledge of the system, we started studying biodiversity and uh, food safety issues like antibiotic resistance. Um, the, the bugs that we, we like the most are all these uh, uh, lactic acid bacteria, which are gram positive, they're absolutely non pathogenic. But uh, many species are abundant in the human gut, they have probiotic feature, features. In food, they have technological features, so they make um, fermentations, make, makes food much, much better. And they are mostly environmental strains. So when you, when you isolate them, the strains are all different from each other. Uh, what was interesting for us was the equilibrium, uh, the, the, the effect of food in affecting the health disease uh, equilibrium in the gut between good bacteria and bad bacteria, because we, we do have pathogens in our gut, uh, a small amount. Uh, they, they're, they're, if we are healthy, uh, we don't really get much of negative effects from them, also because we counterbalance them with uh, a lot of good bugs. But um, the, the, the thing is that in all these very crowded communities, bacteria have the capacity to transfer bits and pieces of their genomes. And when it gets to microbial, antimicrobial resistance, this becomes important, because we don't want uh, something that's resistant to antibiotics in our gut and that maybe can transfer it to opportunistic pathogens and uh, make it impossible to eradicate the infection. So this is something we don't like and it may very well come from <coughs> food. And uh, um, as a matter of fact, we've proven uh, bacteria, genome transfer of antibiotic, antibiotic resistant genes between good and bad. And uh, uh, of course, we're not talking about intrinsic resistance, which is not possible to uh, transfer between bacteria. We talk about acquired resistance, which is usually present in very few strains, carried by plasmids, uh, maybe carried by, uh, flanked by transpos transposons, uh, um, happy to jump from one side to the other. Uh, and we, we are studying the possibility to or to transfer these things horizontally. So uh, there has been a lot of literature on the fact that uh, farming practices uh, and plants could transfer from the soil, could transfer bacteria that carried antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and that's why we took we took up one of these cheeses and exploiting the, 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 um, the knowledge on the technical, um, the, techno the, the, the technological production aspects, we started isolating uh, bacteria at all stages. And what we found, this is old stuff, but just to show you that what we eat is indeed important for our intestinal health. Uh, we saw that, of course, during the steps of production, uh, we have a decrease in biodiversity, and that's expected. That's expectable. And but the good the good news is that also the antibiotic resistance strains decrease. We found none, but this was a culture dependent approach. When we went in with um, primers and uh, and we amplified, we did find some genes. But it's really the the production, the technological production process, really protects us from. Um, uh, this is this is this was just to show you the, the results of the biodiversity. The decrease in biodiversity um, is uh, affects only some of the species in the cheese. It's more obvious in some cases than in other. But the important thing that I wanted to show you is how difficult it is to study these microbi environmental microbiomes. If you produce the same cheese with the same identical um, uh, protocol in the Latina province near Rome, in the Caserta, which is the main place where mozzarella di bufala campana is produced, and in the Salerno region, which are distant probably a couple of hundred kilometers, 
no more than that, you see that the composition, the biodiversity and the composition is completely different. And we are talking, we're not talking about a complex microbiome, we're talking about few, uh, much, much reduced. So that leads me, these were the plasmids that we isolated and we, we, we demonstrated that this uh, coupling sequence confers the capacity to transfer uh, in, in vitro. Um, confers the capacity for conjugative transfer, the other ones don't, but and then we went on and isolated microbes from other, um, not only from dairy, but also from olives in this case, with uh, uh, more recent technologies, we characterized them with more recent technologies, <coughs> and uh, um, I, I want to end with uh, uh, this study just to show you that we uh, we are a hybrid group. We work with microbes, but we also work with uh, uh, with models, with animal models. So we uh, made uh, um, mice fat and obese with diet, with uh, uh, fat diet, and then we gave them. We decided to uh, to see if the complexity. Although it's not a highly complex uh, microbiome, the the, the the one in food is really much less complex than a natural microbiome. But if the single probiotic, probi we, we are given these um, probiotics now, uh, any doctor you go to will give you probiotics. And this is a very common probiotic. Uh, the, um, it's the G strain of uh, Lactobacillus species. Uh, and uh, um, it's a single strain. Uh, if we could compare the effect uh, of uh, the single supplement versus a more complex uh, consortium, because uh, uh, they've started uh, uh, correlating obesity with the microbiome composition in the gut, and especially the ratio between uh, the good and bad uh, bacteria. Um, so we gave them. Uh, we give them this fat diet, and then we divide them in three groups and supplement it with our uh, microbiota coming from uh, this cheese, or the single supplement, the single uh, probiotic, or uh, just a uh, milk. And, uh, and then went to collect the fishes and studied what was happening. And just in brief, uh, um, the supplementation showed that the, the mice who were given, which were given the um, mixed microbiota from the cheese were clearly distinguishable from the other groups, uh, and that only the mixed uh, supplementation had a positive correlation with anti-inflammatory uh, profile and a negative correlation with pro-inflammatory profile. This was just looking at a few cytokines and, uh, and um, the leukocyte subpopulations. But it was interesting to see that we could confirm what, uh, in, in, a, in a mouse model, what is actually um, being uh, stated and coming out from research in all other systems. The complexity is, and also in plants, the complexity really has more beneficial effects than the single strain alone. And this is what I want to conclude with, uh, the, the scientific part, is that now that we are in CREA, we see the microbial flow as the most important key to our studies, also from the human angle and from the human disease angle. Because we have all these environmental microbiomes in the soil, in water, in feed, that really end in and are part of plants and animals that we eat. The, transform, the, the food transformation uh, kills part of it, as we <coughs> saw with the cheese. Uh, so it's really more simplified when it gets into food. But food not only selects in the gut, like carbohydrates, uh, undigestible carbohydrates that select, favorably select certain species of bacteria which feed on them, but f fermented foods also are a vehicle of live bacteria uh, to our gut. They can colonize it, 
somehow, even tr transiently. But in that, in the human gut, they can exert positive e effects, they can exchange genetic material with the residents. So it's really fascinating to think of the flow as being a constant circle of uh, relationships between mm -hmm. not only bacteria and uh, the organisms that they colonize, but also between among the different types of bacteria that compose the complex consortium. And uh, this complexity is uh, the main issue and the main reason why clear-cut results really are hard to, to, to come up with when you study the complex microbiome and we give it to a complex organism. Uh, so what's happening now is that a lot of uh, projects are going towards the standardization because uh, the complexity of the microbiome, for example, but a lot of other things, the complexity of the organism, the complexity of the uh, technical approach that we use uh, really call for standardization. Otherwise, we will never come up with anything. And we are in the advisory board of this uh, H2020 project, Microbiome Support, uh, which started last year, and which is trying to coordinate the research and uh, the, the activities of the microbiome in the food system to support uh, the technology transfer and the, the, the possible uh, goals that we can reach with the microbiome study. Uh, to do this, uh, the most important thing is uh, joint international networks, which are absolutely necessary and working in a fair, compatible environment. FAIR is uh, uh, recent guiding principles defined by findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, i.e. data sharing. Uh, without data sharing, and uh, uh, by data sharing I imply, of course, that all sequences be accessible, <coughs> in open access uh, uh, databases like GeneBank, uh, that the uh, interoperability, that the, the ontology that we use, the language that we use, the approaches that we use to to identify anything in science be standardized and interoperable, uh, communicable, again. Um, and the re reusability of data is something even more important. We use, when we, we do omics approaches, we use a small fraction of the data we produce because we go after a hypothesis, it's a hypothesis driven, so we end up picking up the results that we need to go on in our line of thought. But meanwhile, being an omic approach, we produce tons of data that we never use. And if these data are in open access um, databases, someone else with a different uh, uh, research question can possibly reuse them and broaden enormously the number of data that um, that one can use. I mean, bioinformatics approach. Is, this is true because most of the biology is now computational. And so, with uh, in silico approaches, uh, you need huge number of data, and that's what uh, what all countries are calling for. Uh, we are presently in this uh, uh, knowledge platform, which is uh, doing flanking these efforts and trying to. Um, to basically take all the literature, come up with systematic reviews that can help standardize the information with standardized ontologies and go towards a biomedical sciences research infrastructure that is or will be the only way to join the data and what we can do with, with it in a centralized services, data tools and services place that everybody can have access to. So um, this was the last aspect, scientific aspects I was going to talk about, and uh, I will quickly go through just a few slides to tell you what we do at the ministry. Now, um, this science, I work with science diplomacy, 
And uh, I didn't know that diplomacy could be interested in science before I went to the ministry. Um, what science diplomacy does, it exploits the joint efforts of science and diplomacy toward economic growth and intercultural dialogue between countries. Most of, most of all, uh, it uses and exploits the fact that we as scientists uh, talk and collaborate with other scientists irrespective of the political situation between the countries. You don't interrupt the collaboration because uh, the political asset on the country has changed. So um, what they do is they, they push joint funding, they put some money into um, bilateral, in our office in particular, it's bilateral funding, that means multilateral funding in other offices, but what we do is uh, we um, fund joint research with executive, through, with the tool of executive protocols, which are the practical application of agreements between the countries. And going through the phases of an executive protocol, you really require diplomacy and science to work together. Because initially, you need to coordinate the funders in both countries. And that's a diplomatic effort to which scientists can participate, but it's mostly uh, at the ministerial level, at the funders level. Then there is a, a negotiation phase, which occurs through the embassies, and the scientists are involved into discussing about uh, the priority teams uh, that should be funded with that particular country. Then there is a call and the peer review, which are almost exclusively of scientific, that they require the scientific expertise. And that's when we get into play. And then again, there is a negotiation for the selected projects and uh, the signature of the executive protocol that will last for three years, which uh, call for diplomatic expertise again. So um, not being science uh, a, a, a topic of the diplomatic uh, um, expertise, uh, what they do is uh, diplomacy uses uh, um, scientific experts, both as scientific attachés at the embassies around the world and in an office which is located at the ministry in Rome, which is where I work. Uh, so we are a multidisciplinary team of scientists. We are temporarily from our institution, so we're not uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are hosted by them. And what we do is we work with the scientific attaches because we work on all the scientific, uh, the executive protocols with all countries in our office. And each country, not all countries have scientific attaches, but there's always someone in the, in the embassy who will uh, act as uh, to mediate the information. So we work with scientific attaches around the world. To each one of us follows a few of these executive protocols, and we work with diplomats and with uh, uh, the other scientists in the different steps that I showed you before. The scientific attaches are in uh, about 20, in 26, uh, in 21 countries. There are 26, but there, there are four in, um, in Washington uh, and San Francisco. There are three in China. So depending on the country, you have one or more. You can find all this in the website of the, of the ministry. And they're experienced scientists from Italian university and research institutions. So between <clears throat> the two expertises, the, 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 our office uh, in Rome and the scientific attaches around the world, we run these uh, special relevance, which are research projects and stuff in ch exchange schemes. And uh, as you can see, in the past three years, uh, the number of uh, funded projects increased and as well as the number of people traveling between countries. Um, the money is not, it's not a huge amount. It's meant as seed money to uh, start something and then attract other funds from, uh, from, other, from other agencies. But uh, it can be very useful because uh, it's about 30,000 um, euros per year. Uh, well, I'll skip how this is organized because it's 
extremely important, but we are the office nine of uh, science diplomacy within the Directorate General for Culture and Economic Growth and Innovation. You know well um, Minister Fabrizio Nicoletti, uh, who comes here, and uh, um, with, Can with Councillor Padula, who is in a, the head of a different office, the Office 10, while our head of office uh, very recently arrived from uh, uh, Uganda, where he was ambassador, and is Domenico Fornara, you will have a chance to meet him on your next visit. Um, so, I close by telling you which are the bilateral calls that we're working on for 2020. And this was not intentional, but we have India and uh, South Africa in, in the same year. So they will be coming up, uh, the course will be coming up by the end of 2020. And uh, also I think Slovenia is very close to here, so you might be interested. And Montenegro, if I'm not wrong, is only in uh, stuff exchange, but anyway, the details will come up. And uh, one suggestion is to, to register to uh, at least this platform, because if you register and put in your profile, you get email alerts. Uh, of every single event that occurs in Farnesina that corresponds to your profile. Anyone can register and you get an email saying this call or this event matches your profile. Then you throw it out if you're not interested, but uh, it's in real time. And uh, this is the other platform that it's informative and gives uh, news, calls, opportunities offered to Italian institutions and universities. Um, and also can be an important source of information. And uh, so I end by thanking you for your attention and I hope to have given you some uh, food for thought. Thank you.